بسم الله الامن الاقدس I am Kayvan Yahya and today we are with uh, the world renowned Bayani scholar Mr. Wahid Azal. How are you Wahid? Very good. How are you? Thank you. We'll be talking about uh, the official standing of uh, the Baha'i faith or the Baha'i mafia in uh, Indonesia. Uh, because, uh, Mr. Razal, it's been said that, uh, you know, the Lachman Saifuddin uh, actually has declared, you know, his wish uh, for the Baha'is to become the next state recognized religion. And, uh, you know, in the wake of a query from the Home Affairs, you know, regarding the status of uh, the Baha'ism, Lockman asserted that Baha'is are protected under the Indonesian constitution. You know, my question for you is uh, concerning the current situation in Indonesia, uh, is any content of his tweet likely to be passed as a law through a resolution? That's a good question. I don't believe so. And let me explain why. Indonesia is a Muslim, a majority Muslim country. In fact, it is. Uh, Indonesia has the largest Muslim population of any country in the world. There are um, uh, a couple of million people there. And besides that fact, Indonesia uh, has, over the last 40 years, uh, been the subject of relentless Saudi um, endowment funding and Wahhabi propaganda. Uh, so, you know, the predominant religiosity, the Muslim, predominant Muslim religiosity in Indonesia is a very Salafist and even Wahhabi uh, form of Islam. You have pockets of Sufis and, and uh, more unconventional Muslims throughout uh, the various islands of Indonesia. But by and large, other than a minority Hindu, Buddhist, and even a Confucian population, the predominant religiosity is Islamic. And within the Indonesian parliament... Uh, these people have a very wide uh, representation. And for some kind of a recognition of that nature to occur, you would have to have the assent of at least two-thirds, if not more, of the Indonesian parliament. Uh, and that doesn't look like it will happen. Now, it is possible that the Indi current in the Indonesian government and its minister may attempt um, to grant some kind of a recognition. But um, uh, if that happens, then you would have all kinds of inquiries happening in the Indonesian parliament um, and all of these various groups uh, throughout Indonesia would, would throw a fuss over it. The policies of Indonesian government since the period of Suharto um, has been basically to, without get, granting any governmental or official recognition to the function of these religions, um, is to let them operate uh, so long as these groups don't make waves. Um, and effective, right. yeah, and so effectively what that policy has been, has meant is that missionary activism of non-indigenous religions in the islands of Indonesia um, has not really been subject, you know, to, to the kind of things that you see in other Islamic countries, uh, but they are not allowed or haven't been allowed uh, to go beyond a certain point. Now, this happened because under the, uh, the, pre the previous, I believe, the, the previous Sukarno regime, um, which was left-wing, they allowed, you know, basically all kinds of missionaries and, proselyt you know, proselytization to happen, and suddenly overnight the Baha'i population in, in the islands grew. Uh, and this is when uh, Jamshid Mahani actually went uh, right. to in in the in Indonesia in the 1950s, I believe, uh, and then came out of the jungles of Indonesia claiming to be a manifestation of God at the end, tail end of that experience. Nevertheless, the, nevertheless, right. yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't see this as any serious uh, thing um, because the mechanism, the legal and, and political me mechanisms of Indonesia uh, would not, I, I believe, allow this to happen right away. Mr. Though I'm going to point out, uh, you know, the particular controversial problem uh, that can be traced uh, from the history of Baha'ism, because if you uh, take a look back uh, re retrospectively, uh, you can easily, you know, find out that the presence of the Baha'i faith in Indonesia uh, can go as far back as the late 19th century. Is that true? Uh, 
I believe uh, the problem is the accurate figures for the numbers of followers or adherents to the Baha'i Mafia in Indonesia are surprisingly not available. You know, in other words, we don't know how many uh, Baha'is are at the moment active uh, living, you know, in, in Indonesia. And another question, another problem is the activities of, you know, the Baha'i uh, Mafia, so, uh, were banned in Indonesia yes. in 1972, as yeah, you this know. Was, this was during Suharto's regime, yeah. Exactly. But, uh, you know, under Abdul Rahman Wahid, the religion was uh, then legally, you know, resurrected, you know, yeah. and resuscitated uh, back in 2000, you know. Uh, but the question is, uh, if that's been legalized, uh, so what's the big deal with being uh, officially recognized? Um, the thing is that, that just like in most... See, the, po the political maneuvering here on the part of the Baha'i Mafia is very obvious. They want to get recognition in a Muslim-majority country, so then they can turn around to countries like Iran, uh, you know, or some of these other countries, even Egypt, um, and claim, look, you know... Uh, you know, you're behind the times. Your other brethren in, in Southeast Asia have granted us uh, recognition and they're a Muslim-majority country, but why aren't you doing it? Um, so that, that is basically what this is all about. Um, and the other thing we probably should probably look at is that what is the status of Indonesia in terms of international debt uh, with the IMF? Because one thing that I have noticed is that a lot of these... Um, global south countries that either do maneuvers of giving recognition to the baha'is or something to that effect uh, are always in a bit of a debt squeeze and uh, for some reason uh, every time these countries find themselves in a debt squeeze suddenly the issue of recognizing the baha'is in these uh, global south countries comes up uh, and this is a quite an interesting in, uh, inquiry in and of itself uh, that actually places the proximity of the baha'i mafia uh, within uh, the, the, the international policy making of organizations such as the International Monetary Fund and, and similar. Mm -hmm. Because Mr. Azza, uh, basically having been declared legalized, uh, you know, implied some sort of, uh, you know, social acceptance, you know, doesn't it? Uh, however, you know, the Baha'i Mafia still claims that the Indonesian Baha'i followers uh, you know, continue to face discrimination. Mm. Uh, there is obviously a blatant, uh, you know, uh, uh, contradiction in such a statement, you know. Well, it, it, it is, on? yeah, it is, there is a contradiction. But discrimination in Indonesia, it doesn't just come in a Baha'i mold. Um, Indonesia has a history where the Muslim majority population has, you know, on and off either persecuted either the Sufis or the various... Hindu groups or the various, you know, indigenous um, religions that are indigenous to Indonesia itself, um, some of which are very syncretic, you know, they, 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 they merge Hinduism and, and shamanism, etc. So this is not unique to just the Baha'is alone. But like I mentioned, for a Muslim majority country like Indonesia with a history, a 40 year history of being propagandized by the Saudis uh, and, and their Salafist slash, slash Wahhabi machine. Um, you know, to give official recognition to the Baha'is, um, it, it just doesn't, it, I, I, I don't see it happening. Um, and, and that's just a, that's just a tale. Of course, I have to, I have to say that, you know, Mr. Luxman's uh, tweet uh, was met with mixed reactions and reviews, you know, mm. in Indonesia. But, yes, you yeah, know, I'm aware of that. Some yeah. politicians who's yeah. opposing, you know, his proposal, you know, and others, of course, uh, stating that the Indonesian government should recognize all faith, you know, come what may. Uh, I, think what that, think? That, I think that is the more sound policy. See, you know, this attempt by the Baha'i Mafia and their lobby to get unique recognition is actually um, not about, uh, you know, religious pluralism. You know, governments who have an issue... Uh, with pluralism, that you know, th this is where the question needs to be addressed. 
that you, you know governments need to grant you know universal recognition to all creeds you know within the framework of the law and that is it without naming anybody um, or without giving special status to anybody that would be the path to go and there's nothing wrong with that and Indonesians should definitely consider doing something like that um, but you know giving you know unique and special status recognition to the Baha'is um, for all the reasons stated um, would be extremely po problematic and this is also probably the reason why uh, this announcement by that Indonesian official uh, was was met with actually mixed reviews for that very reason right and uh, you know uh, as I uh, just mentioned earlier the activities of you know the Baha'i uh, mafia so were totally banned in Indonesia in 1972, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, it was uh, actually out loud in Indonesia because, uh, you know, the Baha'i mobs threatened public order and therefore, you know, uh, were not protected by the Constitution, you know? Yeah. Uh, every representative of the Home Affairs Ministry, you know, uh, said such thing. For as I remember, you know, uh, in a parliament session, and it was quoted, you know, and documented in Peter Smith's uh, book. Uh, let me just uh, a book that uh, he co-authored with Mujah Moment, you know, called mm -hmm. the Baha'i Faith. You know, it's a very contemporary development. Uh, you think uh, the the grounds, the main grounds for outlawing you know, the Baha'i Mafia is threatening public order or something beyond that? It is very possible um, that, you know, the, the opposition parties in, in, in Indonesia would look at it that way. And I think they have a, um, a fair concern in that um, the Baha'is are known wherever they go in the global south to proselytize quite aggressively, you know, while naming it something else. Um, and so if these parties, these opposition parties, would be aware of this and have this kind of information at, at hand, um, their, uh, you know, their opposition to such a, to such a policy would, would be based on something like that, particularly because they would then frame it uh, in the context that, you know, aggressive Baha'i proselytization efforts um, would be disruptive to the public and social order of Indonesia. And they would be right. And they would be right. Said, you said, uh, you know, yes, uh, they are obviously trying to proselytize uh, quite aggressively, but uh, do they have the number to do so? I don't believe they do. I think the situation of, of the numbers of Baha'is in Indonesia may not be too, too, too dissimilar to um, the fabricated claims that the Baha'is have made about the number of Baha'is in India. I mean, they've made all kinds of specious right. claims, like there's one or two million uh, Indian Baha'is, right. and then on closer scrutiny we have found out that they don't have even, you know, a fraction of this number. And I suspect that the same situation uh, suffices for Indonesia as well. And given the fact that they are very um, tight-lipped about disclosing uh, the numbers of, of, of Baha'is in Indonesia and the islands there, um, you know, I think it's pretty obvious that, that the same situation prevails. You know, because according to the World Christian Encyclopedia, uh, there are uh, around, mm, you know, 23,000 Baha'is are living in Indonesia. Maybe mm. that's, uh, you know, an overflow, you know. <laughs> I don't know. I remember, I remember in the 80s when they were claiming that there were one million Baha'is in Indonesia. Okay? One million? That's, that, this was during the 1980s, Okay. And now... Um, what happened to one million? There's, yeah. a, there's a huge gap between one million and, uh, you know, 23,000. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, okay, finally, Mr. Ezzel, the some of the, uh, you know, Baha'i official, you know, uh, the poor regimes have time and again stated that the Baha'i adherents... Uh, in Indonesia are not able to obtain, you know, state recognition of, uh, for instance, civil marriages, you know, having limited educational opportunities, you know, and uh, must a state of faith other than, you know, their own on their ID cards, you know, uh, and why are they making fuss about, uh, you know, being uh, discriminated against when, when they... Uh, you know, 
uh, obviously and conspicuously state that they want to take power ultimately in every country they set foot they want to take power you know mm. so why are why are these people making fuss because they're well the, you know the ones that are you know people like the, the this minister that you mentioned are making a fuss because it's very obvious that there is a um, a deep-pocketed Baha'i lobby operating in Jakarta, in the capital of, of Indonesia, that is lobbying and whining and dining these, these public officials there. Um, and so that is where the, the, the statement will, would come from. And especially now, uh, during these um, so-called uh, 200th uh, year celebration of the birth of the Bab, which, is, which it actually isn't, um, you know, they would step up their lobbying efforts in, in world capitals such as Jakarta. Um, and they continue that Baha'i instruction is not part of the official, you know, curriculum on religion set by the National Standards Board. And, you know, similar like Iran, uh, Baha'i students, uh, Baha'i students, sorry, are coerced to, you know, study Protestantism or Catholicism accordingly. Uh, how would you uh, take that? Well, this is a silly <laughs> argument because, look, if, if, you know, even if we grant the Baha'i, the official Baha'i number of 20-something plus a thousand Baha'is in Indonesia, right, that even that number is a fraction of the number um, of adherents of other religions on, on those islands. So for the Baha'is to be um, making a fuss over this fact that their religion is not being represented in the school system is as silly as the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Scientologists in Europe making a fuss about the fact that their ideology is not being represented in the public school systems. You know, they, they are a conspicuous minority. Um, there are more Muslims, there are more Christians, there are more Buddhists, there are more, uh, you know, indigenous uh, practitioners of the local faiths of Indonesia in existence on those islands. Um, I mean, the numbers are so small in the overall population, that it is, this argument itself is ridiculous, that they're, and that they're you making. Know, Mr. Ethel, even in Iran, you know, uh, we have to consider this fact that, uh, you know, Baha'is are allowed to leave blank, you know, the religion field under, for instance, uh, general concurrence or general, you know, examination board for the university, yeah. you know, they are not one way or another they are not required uh, it, it, it is not it is not the requirement the absolute requirement to fill in that that part of the form was taken out during the presidency of Hashimi Rafsanjani that's so right that's this right. was during it the 1990s yeah this was in the 1990s so they are not even required to fill in and identify their 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 adherence and that goes for anybody it, in Iran it's on. Yeah. They insist on feeling that and r even writing comments, even making stupid comments yeah. that, yes, I'm a Baha'i and I'm willing, you know, uh, to, let's say, uh, take part in the Christianity or take part in Islamic question or in Zoroastrian, uh, you know, questions. Uh, why Why do they insist? Why were they... Because, because this, is, this, is a, this is a game. This is a game that the Baha'i administration, the Baha'i powers that be, the Baha'i mafia, um, has been pushing since the 1980s on its flock, whether in Iran or elsewhere, um, because they want to invite backlash. They want to invite you know, mass persecution of their flock in these countries. So that then they can use the occasion to run to human rights organizations like Amnesty International and and what have you, or you know governmental bodies, and claim that they're being persecuted in in Iran or elsewhere. So um, you mean you believe that this uh, you know uh, this uh, kind of uh, you know inconsistency uh, comes directly from the instruction and dictations of uh, the Universal House of Absolutely, Justice. Absolutely, 100%. That's exactly, yes, that's exactly where it comes from, yes. To their opposition to the government, right? To the government and the system, which is then flies in the face of the so-called uh, Baha'i laws and ordinances about being uh, submissive and subservient to the government and the laws in the countries uh, in which you live in. But, you know, in the case of Iran, uh, they have consistently flouted uh, and defied the law, the national law, uh, in Iran. 
Right. And uh, <clears throat> to end the, this, uh, you know, podcast, Mr. Rizzo, would you please tell me, uh, do you think, you know, during the subsequent reform period, you know, in Indonesia, the presence of the Baha'i will blossom uh, any financial invest investment, you know, from the... Uh, you know, foreign governments. Yes, and, you know, and, and this, is, this is why I pointed out that, you know, uh, we need to look at the background of this sort of announcement by an Indonesian government office uh, officer. Uh, because, you know, I have noticed that every time in a global south country there is a debt issue being negotiated with, you know, with foreign banks, the International Monetary Fund or what, whatnot, all of a sudden you have the Baha'is show up in these global south countries wanting to get recognition. Um, and it, it seems to me that, that the granting of, 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 de, of um, loans, etc., by international banks uh, and international bodies, such as the International Monetary Fund, it, it seems to be um, have the, a Baha'i nexus that if they grant these people that kind of recognition, then the loans will follow. But if they don't gra grant recognition, then there's always a problem uh, in, in getting mm -hmm. and securing international loans. And this is this is a whole other discussion that I think at some point we need to get into. So uh, you know, uh, overall, you believe that you know granting buys uh, the state laws uh, will be the Indonesian government's uh, pathway. You know, world center you know, to, to the world economy and you know the world trade. Uh, you know, status quo, right? Yeah, very much so. Very much so. That's, that's, and this is, a, the, the, you know, governments in the Global South who are unaware of what these gr what, what this group is and who they are connected to uh, need to be extremely weary of them because these sorts of underhanded attempts to get recognition uh, on their behalf are, are really um, first world uh, imperialist attempts to undermine Global South countries. And they're using the Baha'is. And the Baha'is are, you know, are willingly allowing themselves to be used um, by these international organizations who are tied to, uh, you know, first world governments uh, to undermine those societies and governments in the global south. In the global south, right. Thank you very much, Mr. Azal. You're welcome. <clears throat> uh, you know, uh, hope to hear more from you. Uh, have a great night. Inshallah.